So I want you to do me a favor for a minute. I want you to go back in time to some of your earliest childhood memories when it comes to church. Maybe your parents took you, or your grandparents, or maybe a family friend brought you. And think about those memories. Some of them probably were good. Some of them were not so good. Maybe some of them were not existing. Maybe that just wasn't a thing for you. But I just want you to go back there for a minute and hang out in that mind space for a minute. So I'm a preacher's kid. I grew up in church, I mean, every single week. My dad was a church planner. And so I remember early on in a church, we met in a shopping center, an old shopping center that hey, we'd buy and they kind of fixed it up. And this one part of the shopping center was unfinished. It was just a shell, just concrete, red iron, steel, rebar. And that was where the kids area was. I was like, hey kids, go over there and play. Don't impale yourself on the rebar, be safe. And so we did that. And so I remember that. I remember on Wednesday night, we had like a little midweek Wednesday night service. I was like late elementary, early middle school. I remember playing football in the parking lot at night. And the only time we would stop the game was when cars were coming and going, how to find parking spots. And I cannot even imagine if someone came to our church and goes, hey, what do you have for students? Well, we send them in the parking lot to play football with all the cars. But don't worry, it's pretty safe. So think about your early church memory. And my guess is good, bad, or maybe non-existent for you, if that doesn't inform that at least shapes your thoughts about church, your expectations about church, your hope for what church will do for you. And if you can, for just a second, push all of those aside. And I want to go back and, and recenter, recalibrate on the very first church. Last week, we looked how it started and God used a guy named Simon Peter who struggled with fear and failure and he preached and 3,000 people got saved and joined the church that day. And those 3,000 people didn't have any previous church backgrounds. There wasn't a church down the street to talk about and look and compare. There weren't books written about church. They, they had zero church experience, but they started the very first church. And we're going to look at what they did and how they operated and, and what their life was like. Because what I hope this pandemic and virus that you and I are living through, what I hope it has reminded us today about church is that church isn't just something that we go to, but rather it's something that we're a part of. Church isn't just something that you and I go to for one hour and one day a week, but it's really something that you and I are a part of. It's not a building, it's a gathering, a group of people. So we're going to go back and we're going to look at that very first church, that very first group of people and how they acted. Acts chapter 2, if you've got a Bible, and I want to start in verse 42, and here's what it says. It says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. That is the very first church. It has nothing to do with the building that they met in, or what denomination they came from. It had everything to do with this group of people coming together and going, Jesus is both Lord and Messiah. So much good stuff in those six verses, but there are two big words I want you to grasp from these six verses in that very first church. The two words are consistency and community. Consistency and community. The very first part of verse 42 says, all the believers devoted themselves. All the believers, community, and the word devoted in the original language means consistently diligent. Consistently diligent. So you have community of believers, consistently diligent. So as you think about church, don't think about buildings or denominations. Think about this very first group of people and their consistency and the community that they had. So let's talk about consistency in your life and in mine. What I want you to understand is that when it came to church, when it came to Christianity, when it came to following Jesus, it wasn't a one-time event. It wasn't like they heard a great sermon, and that's awesome. It, it became a way of life for them. It became something that they became consistently diligent at, habits that they formed in their life. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and, and to fellowship, right, with the right people and, and inviting people into their homes, helping out one another, and to their prayer life. 
So my question for you today is simply this is, what is one consistent faith habit that you can start today? Think about your life. What is one consistent faith habit that you can start today? Because I think now more than ever, you and I have a whole lot of free time and space in our hearts and in our minds. And so as you think about your life and your walk, what is one consistent faith habit that you can start today that you know you need to start? You just go to verse 42 and start there. Pick one there. Maybe for some of you, it's, man, you really need to understand the truth and, and the Word of God and, and what it says for your life. Maybe you need to surround yourself with the right people that encourage you to the things of God. Maybe for some of you, you need to open up your hearts to, and your eyes to help and minister to those around you. Maybe for some of you, it's your prayer life. Maybe your prayer life consists of before meals and when you need a raise at work. And maybe you need to develop your prayer life. Maybe it's starting a journal. Maybe it's listening to worship music. I don't know what it is for you, but when you think about your walk with the Lord, when you think about being a part of a, a gathering of believers, when you think about being a part of a church, you need to think about consistency in your life, the, forming the right faith habits. And you know this, and I know this, and it's, it's true about our life, but if you think about life, marriage, parenting, work, finances, health, big changes come from little decisions made over time. Big changes come from little decisions made over time. So. You don't go from a dysfunctional marriage to a wonderful marriage overnight. You don't go from spoiled brat kids to sweet angel kids overnight. You don't go from being unemployed to being the CEO of the company overnight. You don't go from being broke to having enough money to retire overnight. You don't go from being out of shape to being able to run a marathon overnight. All of those changes take little decisions over time. It's the same for your life and mine when it comes to our faith habits. Those little bitty decisions over time make massive changes in our life. They heard the good news of Jesus, they believed, they gathered together, the church was started, and their habits and their lives began to change. So what is one faith habit, that consistent faith habit that you can begin today? Little decisions that will change your life forever. Second word I want you to focus on is the word community. Community, now let's just talk about the word community for a minute. Let's break it down. It's something common that people are unified around. Something common that they are unified around. And we're out here in this gorgeous backyard with a swimming pool. The swimming pool is nice, but I really want you to focus on this fire pit. Now, I love a good fire pit. If you know me, well, I just, I love being around a fire pit. And my guess is, if maybe you have a fire pit in your yard, maybe you don't, but I'm, my guess is you probably have sat around this fire pit. I think this is a wonderful illustration for community. If you think about a fire pit, and I love circle fire pits because people can gather all around this circle from all different walks of life, ages and stages, different wealth categories, and they're all focused on the fire. They're all focused on something common. They're unified around something common. When you think about the church community, Think about different people from all walks of life, different ages and stages and different wealth categories, education categories, but Jesus is at the center. And so through the highs and lows and ups and downs, that faith community is unified around the common thing of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection, and that he was their Lord and Messiah. So 3,000 people came together that day. Now, I am confident that when you get 3,000 human beings together, I'm confident that there were certain human beings that had, let's just say, difficult personalities. And you know the type of personalities that I'm talking about. But there were 3,000 people, you're certainly gonna have difficult personalities. Different walks of life, different ages and stages, different wealth categories, all that kind of stuff. But they came together unified, not around a hobby, not around an interest, not around a wealth category, but around Jesus Christ. And so you think about the church and you think about community. Jesus is at the center and you're gathered around, locking arms around Jesus, living life through the highs and through those. And what I love about a fire pit, what I love about a fire pit, is that when you have people around it, you can talk about really in-depth, super serious things. Like struggles that you're going through, world problems, but you can also talk about lighthearted things, sports, weather, or you don't even have to talk at all. You can just stare at the fire. It's the beauty of the fire pit. It's the same with Jesus Christ in your faith community. When you're centered around him, boy, you can walk through some of life's difficult things together. You can talk about some really fun, lighthearted things together, or you can just be there for one another. But when Jesus is at the center, 
That's the thing that you're commonly unified around. And so here's my question for you and my question for me is, what does your faith community look like? What does your faith community look like? And if you think about your faith community and go, well, I don't think it really exists. If you don't have a faith community that you're part of, individuals that you gather around, living lives highs and lows, but sitting around Jesus, I'm telling you, you're missing out on one of life's richest, most fulfilling blessings. Like when you live through highs and lows, pandemic, no pandemic, through kids, through financial issues, all of that stuff, but centered around Jesus, there are just fewer things in life that are more richly satisfying than a group of people locking arms, living lives, highs and lows, centered around Jesus. So if you don't have a faith community, I cannot encourage you enough to have one. So what does your faith community look like? And if you're part of one, man, I would just evaluate going, what does it look like? How do we operate? If you look at this faith community, what I love about it is they share their meals with great joy and generosity. Now, in my opinion, I think Christians should be the most joy-filled, hopeful, generous people on the planet. I mean, y'all, we serve a risen Savior. And so these 3,000 people understood that. And all of a sudden, their hearts and homes were filled with joy and generosity and the goodwill of all the people. There was what I would refer to as almost like this holy euphoria. Going, Jesus from Nazareth, He's both Lord and Messiah. He's death, burial, and resurrection. So their lives begin to center around Him. And through the highs and lows, and whether they were persecuted or not, boy, they would center their lives, lock arms with Jesus at the center. So what does your faith community look like? Again, all of our church backgrounds are different. Some good, some bad, some non-existent. Different denominations, different faith upbringings. But if you go back to the very first church, it wasn't centered around a denomination, it wasn't centered around a building, it was centered around Jesus, this common group of people, and all of a sudden their consistency in their life and in their faith habits changed. They began to act different, they began to speak different, they began to seek different things in their life and they're commonly unified around Jesus. And so, yeah, I get it. For the past six, seven weeks, I don't know, all the weeks kind of run together for me. I think it's seven weeks. Our church doors have been closed. But the good news is the church is still alive and well because it has nothing to do with the church building and everything to do with people centered around Jesus. I'm going to finish with two stories. Two stories that are separated by about two weeks in time and about 800 miles geographically, but how you and I are tied so strongly together to them. The first one happened a couple of weeks ago. I was sent a text message by one of our staff members and it popped up on my phone. I looked at it and it was an article from the Forsyth County News. And I looked at it, I had a little picture link on there and I looked at it and I was like, hey, those people, they're a part of our church. And I clicked on the link. There's a group of people in our church that saw a need, saw something that they wanted to do. They wanted to bless their community. So they wanted to take meals to Northside Hospital and just thank those frontline workers for being on the front line and fighting the virus and, and really risking their lives. And so they got together with other church people and they raised $1,400. And they go to Socks Love Barbecue and they buy barbecue for all the workers there and begin to feed them for $1,400. And that was not my idea. That was not a staff meeting where we got together going, hey, we should get the." There was just people going, hey, we're unified around Jesus. We're locking arms. And so let's begin to bless our community. Church doors are closed, but the church is still alive and well. That's story number one. Now, the second story happened two weeks later and 800 miles away in New York City. And this week I got a text from a pastor buddy of mine because you see, two weeks ago, because of your generosity, we were able to financially bless different church planters around the country that had been affected by this virus. One of the church plants was in New York City. I have never met that pastor, still haven't met him face to face, <clears throat> but I was introduced to him and said, hey, this guy's doing an incredible work. If you can bless him, that would be awesome. So I'll call him up two weeks ago, introduce myself, said, hey, here's who I'm with. We want to just send you some uh, financial blessing. He was blown away. Just goes, oh my goodness, thank you so much. This week, he sends me a text and he goes, hey man, I just want to let you know what is going on here in New York City. And he sends me this video of what he and his wife are doing. So this happened 800 miles away. A pastor I'd never met, pastor I'm guessing you have never met, 
But because of the church, because we're unified around Jesus, we're locking arms, you and I were a part of this. And I want you to watch and see the good things that God is doing through this local church in New York City. Take a look. Hey guys, we are so excited today because we have a special surprise for a special group of amazing people. Here in New York City, just a few blocks away from us, and actually like four blocks from where we meet, uh, Samaritan's Purse, which is a relief organization, a Christian relief organization that goes all over the world in relief and disaster zones uh, to provide help and assistance, has set up a field hospital here with 60 beds where they're treating and caring for uh, COVID-19 patients and helping people recover. Uh, to serve our city, to serve yep. the people right here like in totally. our neighborhood. The people that go in our community with our church, the people that serve us at the grocery store, it's like, this is our community. So today we are gonna surprise them with coffee and French pastries from right. one of our favorite neighborhood coffee spots, Frenchies, and we're so excited. At the end of the day, like our city needs help. Yep. And we need people to step up and these people have stepped up and they're sacrificing of their own. Uh, to be here and so we're excited that as a church we get to rally around them and provide uh, these french pastries the coffee as an afternoon kick and pick me up and say thank you so much for what they're doing so samaritan's purse is working with mount sinai east uh, which is literally like right over here and uh, mount sinai east uh, predominantly serves you know the east harlem spanish harlem neighborhood uh, as well as kind of like the most northern parts of the upper east side uh, so this is literally like right in our backyard, people who are connected to where we live, people who are connected to what we do. Uh, and so it's a privilege that they're here serving um, and it's a privilege that we get to serve them. We just finished dropping off all the coffee and pastries to our friends at Samaritan's First. Yeah, we were able to make a delivery of coffee and like 60 something pastries mm -hmm. for all of their staff and volunteers. Uh, some of the people in our church actually even wrote thank you cards and the kids drew pictures. And it was cool, like we were delivering them, they were so excited and they were so grateful for it. But they were like thanking us as we we're trying to thank them. And uh, they were super stoked about, you know, our generosity and willingness to, to serve them in that way. And so we just want to say thank you to all of you who are a part of this. Yeah, thank you for giving. It is because of you guys that we can do amazing things like this. So thank you from the bottom of our heart. Thank you very, very much. Isn't that amazing? Like that is just so cool. And you and I are a part of that. And this week when he sent me that, he sent me this text and he said this. He said, we're providing coffee, pastries, and thank you notes every week to the Samaritans per staff and volunteers working in the Central Park Field Hospital as a thank you. And the funds you guys gave to our church are helping finance this endeavor. You and I, we're a part of that. We've never met him this side of heaven, but because of Jesus at the center, we'll lock arms together. And so, yeah, the church building technically is closed and you and I haven't gone to church in seven weeks, but man, we are still a part of the church and the church is still alive and well and moving. And so when you think about church, I get your past upbringing, good, bad, non-existent, it begins to shape or form. But if you'd go back to that very first group of people, their habits began to change and they're commonly unified around Jesus. That is my prayer for us as a church, as a body of believers, that our lives and our faith habits would begin to change and that we'd be unified around Jesus, locking arms from all different walks of life, but with Jesus at the center. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for who you are. Lord, my prayer is that you would continue to be the center of who we are. You continue moving in our midst and in our, in, in our people's lives, whether here locally or across the nation, or across the globe. Lord, my prayer is that we would lock arms and we'd make you the center of our lives and the center of our community. Now, I get most of you probably that are watching, you've trusted Jesus at some point. But I'm also pretty confident that there's some people watching that you're not quite sure what's at the center of your life. And this whole virus pandemic has shaken you to the core. And the good news is that you can experience that same joy and generosity that these 3,000 people did because of what Jesus did, his life, death, burial, and resurrection. If you'd place your faith in him, your life would be forever changed. And you'd experience that hope and that joy that you cannot possibly imagine. And if you would like that, if you want to receive that, just say something like this, but what's important is that you mean it from your heart and your life will be forever changed. Just say today, Jesus, I trust you. I ask your forgiveness for all my sins. Please fill me with your spirit. Teach me from your word and help me to live for you from this day forward. 
Thank you for my salvation. Amen.